Welcome, everyone. Um, it's so great to see um, to see all of you on Zoom here and to see so many familiar and unfamiliar names on, on the list here. So welcome today to this um, special webinar featuring Dr. John Warner. So we're very excited about this. Um, as you may have heard, he's a candidate for ACS president. So we're excited to chat with him today. Um, I know that, that we still have some folks rolling in now and joining in the webinar. So I'm, I'm just gonna open up with a few, uh, few slides and then we're gonna start the conversation with John. So, oh, and voting is coming up in August through September, possibly to October. I don't know the exact deadline. So please be sure that if you are an ACS member to cast your vote for John in that time. So please look, keep an eye out for that. And if you're not an ACS member, we welcome you to this discussion as well. So please, we're glad you're here. Um, so let's see, I am Amy Cannon. I am the co-founder along with John and the executive director of Beyond Benign, a nonprofit dedicated to green chemistry education. So I'm gonna be your host today. I'm gonna to help facilitate and chat with John and, and um, talk through some questions in particular to his ACS platform. So we are a nonprofit and we're dedicated to fostering a community of educators that can catalyze um, and create change in chemistry education and support of green chemistry. So, and our programs span from K through 12 education, which I can see on our screen here, we have some of our, our lead teachers in, in the room today um, and some of our program managers as well. But um, they span from K through 12 education through higher education. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about our programs, but not today. We're gonna reserve this time today. So if you have interest in anything that we're doing, please reach out to us. I'm happy to connect after the webinar at a, or at a later date. So we're gonna, today we're gonna focus on John and the themes of his ACS candidacy. So before we begin, I am just gonna go over a couple quick logistics. First, I'd like to acknowledge the unceded lands on which Beyond Benign operates. We're located here in the state of Massachusetts, here in the United States, which has been the traditional land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts nations. We acknowledge the history of this land and encourage others to acknowledge the unceded lands and territories belonging to the indigenous nations across the world and wherever you are tuning in from today. Very brief for logistics today as well. For today's webinar, we are broadcasting live and recording this session. So please remain muted, um, just mute your line there. And so we don't get any background noise. Um, questions, you can submit questions right in the chat box at any time, but just to, as a friendly reminder, please do be respectful and professional in the chat box. It is open for, for everyone. So we want to be respectful to our fellow participants and attendees of this webinar as well. Um, we did receive a lot of questions in advance in the registration, which were fantastic. And we, we're gonna try our best to um, address them. We got some really great ones along the three themes and just some in general, which you might guess, we also got some green chemistry related questions. Um, surprise, surprise. So we, we're gonna try to uh, address as many of these as we can. Um, we will be sending out links to the email that you registered for this um, webinar to, with, so that you can access the recording um, if you would like after, but there's the direct link to our webinar archive as well. And we have our fabulous Juliana Vidal on the line today too, who's going to be um, live tweeting today. So if you participate in social media, please do connect with us on Twitter, um, we also are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, here's our, our Twitter handle. And I just threw John's there in the middle too, if you wanted to you know, give a shout out to John along the way too, we'd love to see it. Um, Juliana's joining us from Memorial University in Newfoundland in Canada. And um, she's been working with us on social media. So we're really happy to have her. So thank you, Juliana. Okay, with that, I'm gonna get to John. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction of John and then, um, and then we're going to start getting into some questions. So, um, John, I have, I have a bio of here, of, for you here. Would you, would you prefer to, um, talk a little bit about, um, yourself? Oh, or... no, yeah, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, 
That All right. So people. Yeah. What I'm going to do, if what I'm going to do is, John, um, John has a, a wonderful history um, in industry, academia, uh, experience in um, government, um, NGOs, um, sort of across across industry sectors and across um, different um, positions. And new, he's received numerous awards, such as the Presidential Award. Um, the uh, PASM, sorry, Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring for um, his work in academia. And he's also been recognized an industrial chemist, one of the highest honors as a Perkin Medal, um, Perkin Medal winner in 2014, and also as an inventor um, through his Lemelson and AAAS um, Invention Ambassador, which I hope we get to hear more about because that's one of the themes and for some of his work in government chemicals policy with the Reinventing Government um, Awards from Vice President Al Gore. He's a prolific inventor and um, I guess innovator really in the space of green chemistry and industry. So um, with that, John, I am going to ask you to say, to not be modest here, don't be shy, please. But with our first question, and I think I'm gonna take I'll, I'll I'll stop sharing so we can see you a little bit better too when you're when you're answering these questions. But please tell us a little bit more about yourself. You know, give us a little bit of of your of your history and your background, um, for particularly for those who have not heard heard from you and are not familiar with you as well. So. Okay. Well. 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 Thank you, Amy. I don't. I don't know if sharing the screen improves this event, but uh, hi, everybody. I am. Um, I, I I'm a, have a very strange background. It's a it's quite unintentional world that I've evolved through. I I actually started university as a music major and had every intention of going into music, and through a series of un, of of instances, stumbled into chemistry. And it was a, at a very young age got into the chemistry research lab and literally fell in love with the concept of research and design. And most of my life up to that point, I saw the world as being two groups of people. There are artists and there are scientists. And because I was marginally acceptable as a musician, I was on the artist camp. But when I got into the research lab and I learned what chemistry was, and what chemistry did, I had this um, in my imagination, putting these electrodes in my brain and looking at blips on some device as I compose a piece of music on a piano keyboard or as I designed a molecule. And I said, I bet the same neurological activity happens in both of those cases, that creativity bringing into the world that which hasn't been, been existed before, that's not art, that's not science, that's something else. And when I realized the creative opportunity of, of, of science and of chemistry, I fell in love and next thing you know, I spent oh my God, 50, 60 hours a week as an undergraduate working in the lab. I published five papers as an undergraduate, spoke at the national, my first national academy, uh, uh, ACS national meeting was in Washington, D.C. in my junior year of college and was, have been a member ever since. And so it seems to be a lifetime, which it is. Uh, and then I went to Princeton and got into medicinal chemistry published 16 or so papers on the synthetic strategies to a drug that ultimately became a Limta sold by the Eli Lilly company. Now I had a, a lot of people, I didn't play that important of a role, but I am actually the witness on the research disclosure of that one pharmaceutical. So got into medicinal chemistry and had every expectation that I would go in act into academia as a medicinal chemist. When out of the blue, a senior corporate officer from the Polaroid Corporation had lunch with me and offered me a job to lead an exploratory research group at Polaroid. Now, you got to understand, back in the 80s, Polaroid was like one of the coolest places in the world to, to be a chemist. And so, of course, I said yes, and I became transitioned from a synthetic organic medicinal chemist to a polymer chemist, material scientist, uh, and 
before long had 40 or 50 patents and started to get products in the market. It was during that time that one of my inventions actually made it, um, you know, with one that was getting commercialized and you had to get EPA re registration for that. And there was Tosker in place. But because my invention was so crazy, so different, the EPA needed some more explanation on that technology. So I flew to Washington, DC and met with Paul Anastas, who at the time was the branch chief of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, doing this nascent program called Green Chemistry. And we realized that my technology that I was a prime example of a company going to market with something that accomplished environmental goals. And so here I'm getting involved at the intellectual level. I'm pretty proud of myself. I've got all these awards, all these honors, all these patents. My head is this big. I'm the greatest scientist who ever lived. When disaster hit and I lost my two-year-old son to a birth defect, my, my son John was born with a disease called biliary atresia, where his liver was completely detached from his intestines. And so he couldn't metabolize water and soluble nutrients. He got a surgery at, at birth. And by two, year old, two years old, I lost him. That The night of his funeral, I lied in bed, staring at the ceiling. And I asked myself, wonder if something I touched in the chemistry research lab caused my son's birth defect. I wonder if, heaven forbid, something I got an award for caused his disease and ultimate death. Now, I don't know the answer to that question. And that really wasn't what frustrated me. What frustrated me was I couldn't answer that question. I became reflective of my education. Gee, four years of undergraduate, four years of graduate school, I couldn't identify any time in my education that I was presented with information to anticipate the negative impacts of the chemistry that I might invent. How do you know if something you're about to invent might be a carcinogen? How do you know if something that you might invent might not you know, contribute to global warming and not be biodegradable? And so working with Paul Anastas and the Green Chemistry Program became passionate that this is an opportunity to really address these massive global issues from a root cause. Because if chemists aren't being taught these skills, how are we going to solve these problems? And that is the birth of green chemistry. Paul and I, you know, the evolution of that. Paul and I, we wrote the book and it was published in 98. It took us many years to write that book. So we really started it several years earlier in documenting the 12 principles. And so I realized that although my career at Polaroid was going wonderfully, I really thought that this was an academic opportunity. And so I left Polaroid and I went to the University of Massachusetts, ultimately full professor of chemistry in Boston and full professor of plastics engineering in Lowell. So lived in the both worlds of chemistry and engineering. And we started at UMass the world's first PhD program in green chemistry. And that went really, really well. And we found that we partnered with two-year colleges in the Boston area. We were able to bring in uh, a lot of students that were, at the, that were underrepresented in the chemical sciences. And so I received the, the presidential award uh, for science mentoring from the Bush administration and the uh, NSF. That was for bringing in underrepresented communities into the chemical sciences because providing you know, the, my, my philosophy was, and you'll hear more about this later, is that we need new eyes. We need new ideas in invention and process. If we look at, you know, Einstein said no problem can be solved at the same level of awareness that created it. Well, if we have the same people doing chemistry that's been doing chemistry for the last 50 years. We're going to do the same thing. We need diversity. We need this stuff. And so that was a fundamental tenet of the green chemistry program is to bring in people and to recognize that invention and creativity comes from a diversity of, of perspectives. So I did that for about 12, 13 years. And then interestingly enough, I met an investor named Jim Babcock. 
And we discussed, you know, well, how do we go the next level? How do we show the viability of green chemistry? So in a very daring <laughs> move, if I do say so myself, at the height of my academic career, winning award from the president of the United States, the United States I left academia not because of any disinterest in it because of my love of it, that I thought I could have influence by taking the next step in demonstrating the viability of invention. So I created the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry with Jim Babcock, hired a bunch of people, and over the next 13 years, filed over 300 patents, licensed technologies to over 30 multinational companies, spun out five new companies, an Alzheimer's drug that's in phase three clinical trials, a hair color technology, an asphalt paving technology, a uh, um, photovoltaic, indoor photovoltaic technology, showing that the magic of chemistry, the creativity of chemistry is such that we can solve real world problems with high end chemistry, but also get to the market, show that there's a connectivity to that basic fundamental invention through to, to, to commercialization. And now in, in the, this recent chapter, I have joined the Zymogen Corporation because I feel that the nexus that we're in now is about um, diversity and inclusion, but also bringing in the biological aspects of the future of chemistry and looking at how do we take bio-based materials and practicalize them, do high-end science, but also solve these world problems quickly and get to market fast. And so you see now I'm speaking to you now as Senior Vice President of Chemistry and Distinguished Research Fellow for Green Chemistry and Sustainability at the Zymogen Corporation. So, uh, about nine months ago, when, when someone from the American Chemical Society called me and said that they were asking me to run for president of the American Chemical Society, after I fell off my chair and got back up and said, me? Um, I was just so super honored. And I am so proud and, and, and want to share my vision uh, with so many amazing people that are already active in the American Chemical Society to look at how do we do chemistry? How do we teach chemistry? How do we invent chemistry? And how do we manage chemistry? And so I think that there's an opportunity to put these pieces together and not re you know, not, not to tear down a current thing. We're doing amazing things in chemistry now, but let's take it to that next level. Let's start serving the general community at a higher level and, and do the things that we're meant to do in chemistry to solve these super important problems. We can do this. And I, and I just hope to be a small part of the arc of history that contains the American Chemical Society. That's who I am. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. It was a wonderful introduction, John. Thank you. I mean, and, and I think you might have answered this first question, but really, I mean, why, why ACS president? Um, you know, what, what would you want to do um, with this role? Uh, we got a couple of questions in about this, you know, ACS presidents come and go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a limited amount of time, but what would you like to do with that? And what is most important to you that you might like to continue to work on? Yeah. Um, even after the term is up? Yeah, and, and again, let's, let's be realistic. The president of the American Chemical Society does not have a great deal of power to do anything. So I'm under no illusion that I'm gonna come in and create new divisions and do this. That's not the job of the American government. There is an amazing chief executive officer, there's a board of directors, the infrastructure of the American Chemical Society is, is quite substantial and knows what it's doing. The role of the president from my perspective is to bring in new communities, bring in the opportunity to have new perspectives, to identify, hey, gee whiz, maybe we should be doing this and provide this catalytic thing. And I have no illusion, everything that I dream of doing 
some of it people are going to go eh, and some of it people are going to love and hopefully there's enough of it substantial enough of it that catalytically as the years go by i will have been able to play a little bit of a role in steering the ship in in the directions that i've articulated that's great and you know so building on that you know you mentioned bringing in new communities i mean the first theme of your candidacy is broadening the chemistry community and we got a lot of questions specific to that, but I think people's definitions of broadening vary, right? Depending on where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about that? What do you mean by um, broadening the chemistry community and bringing in new communities? Again, you, you may have seen some of the things that I've written. Um, I feel, you know, I, the image that I like to talk about is that, you know, what we don't do enough in chemistry, that you take a snapshot of any image in the world, like a Times Square, the Super Bowl, a Beyonce concert, whatever, and you look at every object in that picture, everything in that picture was invented. And there is a patent. And that patent has people's names associated it with it. And if you look at the photographs of the people that have invented the world, everyone is there. Every race, gender, nationality, everybody, but they're not there in the right proportion. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize. It's that there are amazing inventions by everybody in the world but they're proportionately not represented well. And so we need to amplify these things to identify that we desperately need these, these people that have different views, that have different backgrounds, because if not, we will continue to do the same things. Now, I have no illusion. I need to work with groups within the American Chemical Society and get feedback from the community of how best to approach this. I don't have any gifted insight on the right way. I have my ideas that I, you know, I look forward to trying, but I think that we need to focus on the difference between, you know, there is uh, two-year colleges, there's four-year colleges, there's research colleges, there's graduate universities. We need to recognize that that portfolio of institutions all make up the American Chemical Society and that there is a, a continuum that is mutually supportive and that right now, frankly, I think some of, some of those groups are being, are being left out either, either and I don't think it's intentional. I can't imagine that there's anyone intentionally doing this, but just inadvertently, there are systemic things we do to leave, leave out groups of people, whether it's based on gender, race, or academic disposition. And we need to take a better look at that, but we need to act upon it too, not just study it, not just think about it, but do the best that we can to to address those issues I, and i i you know, and i'll need a lot of help with that but we we need to do that for sure yeah that's that's interesting that you bring that up because there was some very specific questions that came in about community colleges in particular mm -hmm. and there seems to be some concern over lack of support and resources um, through the acs for community college level and i know like you you might not know answers to these questions and like you said you'd, you'd have to reach out and chat with the right people but, but I mean, what do you say to those concerns or, or what are the opportunities that you see for community colleges to really help with this goal of broadening the chemistry community? It's critical. It is absolutely essential. You know, that I, I, I don't see a viable future for the chemical enterprises without two-year community colleges. It, it's a critical part of our chemical chemistry education infrastructure. And, you know, I want to learn more about where there's gaps, you know, I, again, and just to be clear, I have limited power influence as president. I can do the best that I can. I definitely want to learn more about what's, what's going on there. That saddens me greatly because through my career, we've interacted quite a bit with various, um, you know, local in the Boston area, uh, two-year 
uh, community colleges. And we've actually taught at some of the programs. We've had research opportunities in previous jobs, bringing you know students and faculty in. To, and so I've, I've always uh, saw that as a, a critical part of the tapestry of chemistry. And so this concern, frankly, is something I need to, to learn more about because that, that troubles me. Yeah, you're right, and it's such a tremendous um, opportunity for the, uh, you know, creating pathways. Yes. Um, you know, and there's some great success stories too. Yeah. And, um, and again, that's it's it's interesting because you know when I first started being a professor, because I was in industry for such a long time before I went into academia. It's kind of an interesting perspective. You know, I, I used to, you know, start the first the first lecture and say to the class look to your left, look to your right. If one of you aren't here at the end of the semester, I failed you. Let's make sure that that doesn't happen. All right, and I think there's too much of, you know, we need to, to have, have ways to have people survive and thrive in chemistry. And that is an important role of the two-year colleges in and other things. And so we definitely need to, to work on that. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and of course, there were some questions related to broadening the chemistry community to include green chemistry. So how can we, um, you know, get more involvement from companies in the green chemistry movement, you know, shifting from maybe some more traditional chemistries to more sustainable chemistry. And similarly in academia, I know that this is a huge question. So we're, we're going to get to some of the more education ones later too. So whichever part of that you would want to talk. So, so, so we have choose your metaphor, chicken, egg, cart, and horse. Um, but we haven't, you know, so in my experience, I have visited no less than 200 corporations in the chemical enterprises and have met with, have had workshops, have worked with directly and co-inventing things. And in the industrial, um, landscape, I see a desire to do green chemistry. But I, what I don't see is an overwhelming ability to do it. When we talk about these sustainability, and it goes back to that epiphany that I had back when I was at Polaroid, is that wanting to make something non-toxic isn't the same as being able to make something non-toxic. If, if, if I want to make a red dye, okay? I know I can go back to my class that taught me about particle in the box and predict the UV, UV vis chromophore and why something might be a red dye. I can look at the intermolecular forces and figure out why it would mordant on a textile and stick. I can look at the PCHEM and the homo lumo energy gap and predict why the photostability, how I can make it photostable. But if someone says, don't make it a carcinogen, a carcinogen, what? There's nothing in my education that gives me even, now, of course, I never took a class on how to make red dyes, but I can project from a class on that. I never had a class on how to make things stick to fabrics, but I can project. But what, what's absent right now from our curriculum is that fundamental knowledge that can be extrapolated. Now, we don't want to, we don't have the time in the curriculum to make people junior toxicologists, but enough of it so that we can move from wanting safe and non-toxic materials to having the ability to literally start addressing it. And so the chicken and egg thing is if industry wants it, but is academia preparing those students? And again, obviously it's quite self-serving here beyond benign is doing an amazing job at the forefront of this. There are some, what, 70, 80 signers of beyond benign green chemistry commitment. That is literally changing the world every week. A new university is committing to this, but there are thousands and thousands of universities out there, so we've got a long way to go. But if you can have a product that works as good as an incumbent technology or better, costs appropriate, and oh, by the way, is also better for human health and the environment, who's going to reject that? I would argue the only stumbling block is its invention. And are we learning how to invent? And are we learning to invent in a way that addresses the sustainability issues? 
we're doing an amazing job in chemistry, but we can do better. All right, I promised I wasn't going to talk about Beyond Benign, but you you brought it up, John. All right, so, all right, uh, all right. On the line is um, Nimrit Obi. She is our program manager um, in higher ed, who's working on our toxicology and chem for chemist curriculum. So if you want more information from um, connect directly with um, with Dr. Obi with Nim, right right on the line here. So find her in the participant list uh, to learn more about that. It's coming soon. So that is wonderful, John. Of course, you're speaking my language. Um, <laughs> so thank you and um okay so that's wonderful and i'm gonna i think i'm gonna wrap up this time on the broadening you know there's so much talk on, on diversity equity and inclusion and belonging and respect um you know with all of the events over the past year and a half and so it's it's wonderful to see so much focus i mean what what are some ideas of bringing in more maybe specific minority members um how you might facilitate, and again, I know there's limited control on this, you know, but how you might, you know, help uplift voices or help to facilitate diversifying um, membership or, or, you know, even representation in the chemical sciences. One, one thing that I feel the American Chemical Society has amazing opportunities to shine a spotlight on wonderful things that when when people, you know, there's, there's a lot of that are about visualization, you know, obviously looking at me, I'm not that athletic, but um, people say, you know, you got to visualize crossing the finish line, you got to visualize getting the ball in the net, whatever, you need to be able to visualize success. If somebody dreams of being a musician, they know that they're going to pick up an instrument, it's not going to go very well, they got to practice, practice, practice. And then there's a pathway where one day they'll be an amazing musician. If someone wants to be an athlete, they know the first time they try to throw a ball, it's not gonna go so well. But if they practice, 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 you can visualize that path. Do we have a path to visualize becoming a chemist, becoming an inventor, becoming a scientist? I would argue not so much. And so communities that can't see that path are inhibited because of that. And if we as a community shine the light on these success stories and illustrate examples of success and opportunities and possibilities, then people can visualize it. And if you visualize it, you can achieve it. So one thing we can do much better as a community is to shine that spotlight and invite, invite our, 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 our broader community to say, come with us let's let's find these success stories let's show how it can be done because again like i said when we look at our portfolio of patents and inventions and amazing discoveries everyone is there there are examples they're disproportionate to the population but they're there so we need to be in the mindset of amplifying what is already there but not enough and make it so much better yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think back to remember the days at Warner Babcock where we would host um, school groups with K through 12 yeah. kids. And one of the activities, it's not our activity, this is an activity that's out there, but we would ask kids to draw a scientist. And I, I would say early on, we would always get the Einstein looking character. But yeah. more and more recently, we're getting a more diverse, you know, representation. They're, they're even drawing themselves up there as a scientist, yeah, which cool. is super exciting. That's so. Great. So I love that. If you can visualize it, then um, you can get there. Um, okay, let's see. I'm okay. If it's okay, I'm going to move on to invention education. We got some questions in, um, some great questions in about that. Um, and I think there was just some questions just around what is invention education? And um, I should say also, sorry for the shameless plugs here, but I should say on the line we have Jane, um, Janie Butler, she is in our list here of participants um, and she is, I'm finding her here. And um, so please reach out to her if you're looking for resources at the K through 12 level. She's our fantastic K through 12 program manager working in invention education. Um, but basically what is it, you know, how and how can this translate, you know, what are the goals of invention education, I guess? So one of the things, again, living in the dual worlds of chemistry and engineering, you know, I am profoundly jealous, but very, very 
in awe of these robotics competitions. You know, we've gone to these, oh my God, they're, they're hockey stadium filled with kids and students that have worked to make robots that move something and put something over there. And over the last 10, 15 years, there has been an absolute transformation in engineering to solve problems. And, you know, you, yeah, I'm too old for this, but the strobe lights, the loud music, <laughs> well, people are using robots and everyone's screaming and applauding and oh my, it's amazing. We can do that for chemistry too. We, it's not unattainable. There, and, and when you think about it, there are so many needs. And so can we start looking at, at, at what does it take to invent a technology that's chemistry? Imagine that you have a stain and the robot has to go and clean the stain with a cleaner that doesn't hurt the environment. Imagine that the robot mixes something together to make some kind of a polymer that's not using an endocrine disruptor. Imagine, you know, on and on and on. Can you imagine if engineers partner with chemists and, and, and actually share in this excitement of inventing technologies that have this pragmatic application? And I think when we go back to education, I, I, I am a first generation student. My parents had no idea what chemistry was, what university was. They were somewhat distrusting of that process. And so I would go home and I, and I would talk to my professor. And if I came home and I said to my parents, hey, dad, I'm learning a new way to stereospecifically add a hydroxy group beta to a carbonyl. He would have beat me up, all right? But if I instead go and say, there are unmet needs, that there are materials in, um, in, in commerce that are hurting people, or we just need new materials to enable things in my research, and what I'm learning as a chemist is gonna help be able to, if we're into it, making spaceships to, to help the space race or making non-toxic technologies that don't create ocean plastics to, and on and on and on. When there is an application, the peer group of the less attuned to the uh, academic culture will recognize its need, will recognize its, its import, and will bring that diversity of community in because there's a certain profound pragmatism that, okay, well, what if, you know, I, I don't want to make a hydroxy group, you know, stereospecific, a beta to a copy, but I would love to invent a technology to remove a carcinogen from the world. And so that invention creates the intention of why am I doing it? Now, I would argue every research has a potential application. It, it's almost unfathomable to me that any ability to manifest change in a predictable way with a little bit of imagination, one can uh, imagine a pathway where that creates profound use. Now, some people don't want to get into that, and that's good. We need fundamental basic research, but remember, no technology is basic research. The researcher is doing basic research, but the technology can always be made applied. And so it's the intent that, and the world needs a diversity. Some people that want to focus on the fundamental science, the mechanistic interpretation and understanding, and some people want to focus on what are we going to do with this technology? And in chemistry, I think that this, we're losing a lot of people because of that desire to have that intent. And that's where invention comes in, is science with the intent to solve a world problem. And, I, I, and it's, it's not in any way suggesting that, that fundamental research isn't very important, super important. But if we are going to broaden the community, invention is a critical component. That's great. And, and what are the opportunities in terms of education and bringing, implementing this in schools and um, curriculum? Well, again, this is a great opportunity for corporations to get more involved. You know, again, when we talk about uh, shining a spotlight, you know, every corporation 
have people working for them that not too long ago were university students, either undergraduates or graduates, and they're working on inventing new technologies. We need to create this interloven um, um, network in which those students are being highlighted. Now look at, I'm working on inventing a biodegradable diaper. Look, I'm, look, I'm working to invent a new diabetes drug. Look, I'm inventing, and, and all the wonderful things that we're doing in chemistry, communicating back, not just to the, to the, um, the, the graduate and undergraduate schools that they came from, but back to the high schools too, to create that pipeline, that vision, and again, that pathway to what I want to do. As you know, people have said time and time again, if uh, his, you know, the the data and statistics show that if a child by 12 years old has not had a positive experience in the sciences, it's unlikely they'll ever go into it. Well, let's give them those positive experiences because there's surely plenty of them around. That's great. I love it. I'm going to shift over to multidisciplinary so we can get a little bit, and then we're going to get into some more specific questions too. Um, but, you know, I guess, what do you mean by multidisciplinary um, orientation? Like, is this, um, you know, is this beyond the sub disciplines of chemistry, even the sub disciplines of, or, or you know, scientific disciplines? Right. Or, um, you know, we got let, let we me, got a lot of interesting questions in this space. All right, well, let, let me let me just preamble and wax off the cuff philosophically here. One could imagine that philosophy, you know, the the science or the art of logic and logical constructs, is a foundation to provide for mathematics. And that mathematics evolved and provides a foundation for physics. And that physics provides a foundation for chemistry. And chemistry provides a foundation for biology. And biology forms a foundation for sociology. And sociology for, and, and, and psychology and the, the science of the mind. And that psychology and sociology provide a foundation for philosophy. We're on a circle. There is no line that there is a continuum of human knowledge and human endeavor. And that is there such a thing as a biologist? Well, there's textbooks that they read. Is there a thing called physicists? There are, but from my perspective, you know, humbly I'll present to you, that there is nothing in the universe of knowledge that creates these boundaries. Those boundaries are human constructs. And when we talk about tearing down the boundaries, we're missing the point. Those boundaries never existed. We created them in our minds, they're illusions. And so it's really important not to be looking at how do we pull down these barriers? They're not there. They're in a, and if we think they're there, that gets in the way. But the continuum between chemistry and biology and then the whole concept of, okay, we need to have investment. How do we get investment? There's a, a, a boundary between investment and basic science and fundamental science. And then there's marketing and then there's sales and then there's communication. There's no aspect of human endeavor that doesn't directly relate to things that chemists do. If chemistry is the central science, if we accept that statement, that means we're involved in everything. And I sincerely believe we are involved in everything. And so there are no boundaries. Get over it. Everything is a continuum. And that we need to start accepting that pretty much everyone is working with molecules in some way, have either, either as neuro, neurologically functioning in their brains or by working on things with beakers and flasks in the lab. Chemistry is in fact everywhere. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, how can, um, you know, basically how can these multidisciplinary approaches be used to really transform um, the industry, the chemical industry of, of today to, you know, in support of a better tomorrow? Well, I, again, the thing is, is that industry mostly does. Industry will have marketing. Industry will have 
sales, we'll have engineering, we'll have chemistry, we'll have all these disciplines and there'll be nice circles around them and things like that. And we chemists tend to be in our little box. And what we need to do is we, we need to, in industry, have people, you know, when I was at Polaroid, I instituted a program, a day in a life program, where people in my group would spend a day working with someone in marketing, would spend a day working in somebody in sales, working someone in, in manufacturing. And so that, you know, it's when someone is far away and you never see them and you never talk to them, they're quite mysterious. But if you spend a day with them and, and, and go to lunch and start talking to them as a human being, all of a sudden seems the world starts to come away and you find that there was no barrier there. But if you never have that opportunity, if you never have the ability to visualize that, it doesn't happen. And so we need to find ways not to have people come in and do lectures about I'm a marketer, this is what I do, but actually give experiential opportunities for people to 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 live those lives even if just for a tiny minute because that relationship can be lasting sometimes people will hit it off and years later they'll be calling each other emailing each other texting each other asking questions and things like that we need in the american chemical society as the greatest science convener on the planet has an opportunity to with deliberate intention find ways to make these things happen Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so to bring sort of all three of these, um, you know, we got a, a great, we have some very, very specific questions that are related to each of these themes too, that I think we're going to, we're not going to have a chance to get up to all of them today, but I'm, I'm going to see if John's able to, you know, respond to some of them that we'll get out to participants. But, you know, wrapping up these, these three themes, I mean, how do you propose that we sort of combine all three aspects of your platform into this sort of nexus nexus for a more more holistic inclusive um sustainable future grounded in chemical sciences it sounds wonderful but i mean well, how do we, yeah. I, I i interestingly enough i feel that we in chemistry are singularly uniquely given some skills to help in these massive global issues Heaven knows we're in a very polarized society today, right? You, you just, we're, everything is polarized, you know, the left, the right, the up, the down, the Yankees, the Red Sox, everybody's in a camp, everybody's on a team, you've got to choose one thing, you've got to choose another thing. We're so polarized. And we're at this moment, but how do we resolve this? How do we do this? Well, let's take a step back and look at chemistry. When you have a molecule that has more than one resonance structure, is the molecule defined by one resonance structure or another resonance structure? No, in chemistry, we're perfectly happy seeing it as a composite of both. One may be polar, one may be nonpolar, but we in chemistry don't see it that way. It is an amalgamation. When we have a molecule that has two tautomeric forms and we have the hydrogen here and the hydrogen here, is it defined by one? No, we're perfectly comfortable with molecules having different states, different dispositions and different things. We, the science of chemistry has come to embrace this diversity of structure, this, this, this diversity of form, and doesn't see it as a problem, but sees it as a strength because resonance and tautomerization creates different states that at the end of the day makes the system more resilient and more stable. The more equivalent states and amalgamation of states we know in science creates stability and strength and there's strength in that that we have not tapped into. And so we in chemistry have built 150 years of science, mathematics of calculating these things. Our view of the natural world, we have an opportunity to share that at, with the greater community. And that's why I see that all these things can come. Now, I know that this is philosophical and kind of silly, but right now at this time in life, we need this kind of approach. We need to believe that there's a way forward. And I really do believe not only from a material sense, but in some very pragmatic ways, chemistry and the way we do chemistry offers society a whole lot. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that's um, so I'm going to move on to some to sort of with our final 10 minutes here. Of course, we got some very, you know, green chemistry specific questions. Um, and I saw in the chat box some um, mention of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and sort of the there's a corporate guidebook and the need and necessity for green chemistry to be included. I mean, what is the opportunity for chemistry to help address these global goals, which are ambitious? Um, yeah. So, so one of the things that I have found in, in, in my experience is semantics in vocabulary get in our way more than concepts, all right? And that when two people start with some disagreement, now not always, but oftentimes I sit back and I look at the dialogue and both people are the saying the same thing, but just with a different vocabulary. And so when it comes to all these global issues, climate change, sustainability, toxics in the environment, I find that there are more people who agree than don't, but they're talking by each other because they're different, using different language and different words. The UN SDGs, let's just be candid, they're not perfect, but they offer a commonality. There are seven items in which we can focus on 17, 17 items that we can focus on those 17 things and say, here is a way that we can move forward as a society. And I promise you, the chemical enterprises has a central role, not in some of them, but in every one of the 17 UN SDGs. Again, I hold it as a fundamental premise. If we claim chemistry is the central science, we can't pick and choose which of the 17 UN SDGs apply to us. They better apply to all of them, or we better not call ourselves the central science. And I firmly believe, and we've done a lot of talking and publications on how chemistry fits in and is a fundamental component of all of the UN SDGs. And we need, to do better at addressing them, and we can. It's not a. It's it's um, not a matter of can we do it. It's can we assemble the will and pull our society together from an investment perspective, from an education perspective, from a government management perspective. Can we move forward? It's not going to be easy, but we can do it. Yeah, agreed. And speaking of you know these grand challenges and global global sustainability issues. You know, what are some of your ideas for prioritizing um, green chemistry research? We had some very specific questions come in about specific chemicals of concern, such as PFAS or some chemicals of very high global warming potential, mm -hmm. um, or even specific endpoints such as endocrine disruption, endocrine disrupting chemicals. I mean, how do we prioritize? And what do you see as the priorities for research and phase out of these of these um, you know higher hazard chemicals or or you know how do we address these challenges? So uh, a couple approaches, a couple thoughts here. You know, one of the things, that, and as you can imagine, in my life, how many times I've been asked, what is most important? Should we work on PFAS? Should we work on endocrine disruptors? Should we work on this? Should we work on that? And I. My first answer is I believe in the power of humans to solve some problems, not all of them. And so education is the number one issue. Can you imagine if every chemist who graduated next year had some training on the principles of green chemistry, what makes molecules an endocrine disruptor, what makes molecules a carcinogen, we have no idea what those people are going to do when they graduate. We know, don't know what jobs they're going to have. We don't know where they're going to go. But armed with that knowledge, armed with that ability, that gift that we give them through education, what we do know is they're going to do something. And whatever they do is going to be wonderful and it's going to start solving these problems. So why would I so presumptuously sit down and say, let's work on this? Let's work on them all. And the way we work on them all is we focus on education and trust people to fit those things. And if someone is passionate about wanting to rid the world of carcinogens, then oh my goodness, we should give them the skills and let them work on that. If someone is passionate to rid the world of endocrine disruptors, let's give them the skills and let's have them do that. We don't want to tell someone that's working on endocrine disruptors, well, that's not as important as this. We need all of these things. And the chemistry community is huge. 
We don't have to pick and choose. Now, when it comes to financing, when it comes to, to the ability to create an infrastructure financially to do that, that has to have prioritization. That has to have NGOs and government organizations come to grips with how we fund things. And if, you know, the federal government, Congress does allocate and mandate certain directives to the NSF, the NIH, the DOE, all the, the government agencies. And so we do have influence as human beings in how we vote and how we communicate with our elected officials to steer some resources in the federal government. They aren't like they were 30 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a lot more funding in the federal government for technology. It's not gone. Two years ago, the uh, Sustainable Chemistry Research and Development Act passed unanimously, okay, all people voting for it unanimously, left and right, passed it, okay, that is a success, I was thrilled to be able to testify to the, to, to the House on that, that meeting, there are ways to start funding these things, but I would be so presumptuous for me to pick, if you ask me what I think is really important, definitely endocrine disruptors are critical, carcinogens are critical. I think that, that um, biodegradation and uh, plast ocean plastics, there's so, you know, just pick it. Again, I, I hate to say that my opinion matters here. There's too many important issues. And what solves the thing about invention and invention with intention that people sometimes don't get is intellect is super important in invention, but the most important ingredient in invention is passion. And if someone is passionate to invent something, they will invent it. And so we need to enable, to enable every individual, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are, if they have a passion to do something, the chemical enterprises should give them those skills, facilitate that because the world desperately needs it. All right, that, that is wonderful. And you did mention education and I was gonna, my last question here with our remaining minutes, which are running short, is really in green chemistry and education. So we had a few come in, well, several come in actually, but um, about green chemistry education in particular, we had one looking for recommendations for, I think, you know, advancing green chemistry ideas um, within, you know, with administrators. So how to get that sort of administrative buy-in and another asking what it's gonna take to get green chemistry required in the ACS accreditation mm -hmm. for um, higher ed chemistry departments, there is the, the supplement that is, mm -hmm. is there now, but beyond that, and um, I, I'm gonna give a shout out to CU Boulder who has a great, um, uh, a great survey with they, where they gather some data where there's showing, they're showing there's great interest in green chemistry from students, students want this. Um, and then, you know, and then we also got some questions on supporting um, high school teachers in, in facilitating green, green chemistry and their teaching. So there's a lot there. I know that there's, you know, and we're running limited on time. So. All right. So, so again, I feel like since I've been a member of the American Chemical Society, how, you know, and, and got into green chemistry have felt very strongly that we need to to bring this in now my my candidacy is, is goes way beyond just focusing on green chemistry but the cpt has a tough job you know that there are so many constituents there are so many people that are pulling we should have this in the curriculum we should have this in the curriculum we should have there is virtually the poor cpt can never make everybody happy and so some people are going to applaud them and there's going to be somebody shaking their fist at them all the time so i do not envy the job of cpt <laughs> If I'm president, I'll probably be visiting them a lot and having some discussions and I may be successful, I may not be successful, but I'll be encouraging CPT to embrace green chemistry a little bit more and other things like invention and things like that. And will I be effective? I don't know if the community is going to support me and come with me to talk to the CPT. Maybe we can be effective. All I know is that that's, that's where I want. But again, it's I have absolutely the highest respect for CPT and what they've been doing. And it's, it's just not an easy job. 
And so we, we need to, to work with them and find a path because then if they make that, because the, again, the chicken and egg, horse and cart thing, if they do all universities have the resources to deliver on that. So if CBT says you need to have it and the universities and the, the schools can't do it, what do we do then? So we need, this is a, a bigger systemic and <laughs> oh. and so so I am you know, very proud to be a full member of the Club of Rome and the Club of Rome goes way back to the uh, early days of systems thinking so uh, Donella Meadows back in the 70s wrote the first book her book on on systems thinking and so I, I am a, a embracer of the whole concept of systems thinking and when we look at the chemical enterprises there is a, a an obvious and and in a way when I say there are no boundaries that boundaries are an illusion that's because a system has no internal boundaries and so systems thinking is recognizing that boundaries don't exist and so the the where we need to be here is is to to recognize this this whole systems concept i love that and that i think is you know bringing it full and more holistic and to, to a system might be a good way to close this i know that recording reminder there was that we're beyond our hour which i'm oh, sorry sorry I... no no not at all this has been wonderful and we really thank you all for joining um i am going to just briefly share my screen so I will mention too, um, you know, Zymergen was our partner in this. So thank you, Zymergen, for sharing John with us and this um, with this time. Um, we're really, we wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors and our partners um, that allow us to do the work that we do and carry out programs such as this. We do have a couple upcoming events that I just wanted to notify you of too, both in higher ed. This um, The one on the left is specific to green labs. And then the one on the right is our amazing lead teachers. You are welcome to join in and learn more about some of our K through 12 programming and hear directly from our teachers um, if you're interested in green chemistry in K through 12 classroom. Um, with that, John, thank you so much. If you, you know, <laughs> We, this has just been wonderful. I love the themes, um, all three, and that sort of all-inclusive um, view of bringing, you know, seeing chemistry as that central role in, um, oh, geez, so many things. So thank you so much for your views and your time today. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, to join us. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to listen, and I look forward to further conversations. The, the, the national meeting in the fall has some uh, town hall type structures. They haven't been precisely scheduled yet, but there will be some webinar broadcast town hall things during the ACS national meeting, not in, in Atlanta, but it'll be virtual. And so there will be other opportunities to have future conversations. And I, and I open my website, johnwarner.org has an email in john at johnwarner.org is my email address. Uh, do the best. I get about five, 600 emails a day. I'll do the best I can to respond and reply. Um, but I, I, I will reply. <laughs> I will. Yeah, he will. And we, and again, we'll get those responses. If we didn't get to your question, we'll get out, uh, we'll get out the answers on that or feel free to reach out to us directly. So with that, thank you all so much. Thank you, John. And, um, Vote for John. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.